We are back for part two of my Walt Disney World trip report, including Disney's Hollywood Studios, all the places we ate, transportation, so much more info. This is going to be fun. You're listening to the Tomorrow Society Podcast. Thanks for joining me here on episode 229 of the Tomorrow Society Podcast. I am your host, Dan Heaton. This is part two of my Walt Disney World trip report. If you did not listen to last week's episode, go do that first. In that one, I went through our days at Epcot and the Magic Kingdom. This was on a spring break trip that I took with my daughter, Etta, who has just turned 11 years old. We arrived on March 18th. We went to the parks March 19th, 20th, 21st, and then flew back late that night. So today I'm going to talk about our day at Disney Hollywood Studios, which at the very end, we flew back to St. Louis. I am also going to talk about dining, not everything we ate, just some of the highlights, quickly go through the various things we had. Also going to talk about how transportation, how that worked with getting from the airport, with rental car, with bus, everything else. And hopefully through all this, it's not just me talking you know, here's what we did. Well, it's I can give you a few tips or some info on what it was like. The crowds were not too bad. They were not nearly as bad as the week before on spring break. And then this week, Easter week. And we really lucked out with that because that is not what I expected. I've got a lot to say, so let's get right to it. Here is part two of my Walt Disney World trip report. <laughs> So in a similar fashion to our day at the Magic Kingdom, I knew we had stayed up pretty late the night before. We were at the Magic Kingdom till about 10. By the time we got back and everything, we were looking at, you know, it was 1030 or something. So with the studios, I knew we were going to try and get there right at 830 or 9 o'clock. The park opening was a 9, so early entry would have been 830. But I did know that since we weren't staying till the very end, I wanted to make sure we had time. And I also did not anticipate, again, you think by now I would have learned that the crowds would be less. So I mentioned last time about Standby Skipper, which, again, I think worked out very well. This was probably the best example where I have found in the past that even if I'm as fast as I can go, Slinky Dog, I just cannot get an early time. So this time I set it up, told them to search for it. And the app found it at 9.10. Not 9 o'clock, but 9.10 till 10.10, which, wow, that's really great because that sets you up for the rest of the day because then you can use that and then immediately book another one before most people aren't booking till 11, two hours after the park opened. So we got to the park around 10, a little before that. We drove there and it was very easy to get to and get through. So we didn't have to rush at all. Went and rode Slinky Dog, which I have done before. Etta has never done. For her, it was really cool. And I think she enjoyed it quite a lot. Slinky Dog is one of those where I think it's a solid coaster. I think it's a good step up. I think it's slightly more thrilling than Seven Dwarfs Mine Train. But still a little less. It's you know It might be on the par with Big Thunder, but I think of it as... I don't know. It's similar. It just doesn't have the theming, so it's a bit different. It's more of a coaster than a theme park ride, in a way. Even with some of the theming, it's not as significant. Even with the outdoor queue, the way it is and everything else, I think of this as being themed, and it looks cool, but not as much unlike most Disney coasters. But I still like Slinky Dog a lot. It'll be interesting. I'm going to look back at my Walt Disney World roller coaster rankings, which I will be adding Tron and Guardians to. And I admit I don't have it memorized. But Slinky Dog in the past wasn't that high. And I'm not sure it's going to move at all. And this is nothing against Slinky Dog at all. It's just, for me, I know it's super popular because most people can ride it. And for this park, you know, the only other coaster is Rock and Roller Coaster, which a lot of people might not be ready for. But I do feel like Slinky Dog functions really well as kind of the next step up. And also this park really needed another big draw to take the pressure 
you know, it came before, but take the pressure off of the Star Wars attractions and even Tower of Terror and when it's running Rock and Roller Coaster. So we did that. Etta enjoyed it. Everything went smoothly, got out of there pretty quickly. And I immediately booked the lighting lane for Tower of Terror, which was a little bit out. So we thought in between, let's go meet Mickey. This was the other time beyond Big Figment that we met a character. And this was our longest wait on the entire trip. The line said 25 minutes. It ended up taking about 35. It was just a standby wait. That was all we did there. You know, it's Mickey is Sorcerer Mickey, and Minnie is like dressed up for a fancy gala, and it's at a place called Red Carpet Dreams. Pretty convenient, just, you know, right in the middle kind of of the park. Ed enjoyed it. I do like some of the little touches, like they have the posters that look like they're static posters, but then ultimately come animated. That's while you're waiting for Mickey, the second one. You wait. That's the thing. You wait for Minnie, meet Minnie, and then you might have to wait a little bit for Mickey, not as long. But it was the longest wait, but we had planned to meet Mickey at the Magic Kingdom. And with the location of where that is, if you don't do it right when you come in, you ultimately don't always get back down Main Street. And we did have the time where we could have jumped in line right before closing, but it was still listed at like 40 minutes. I probably wouldn't have been that long. It probably would have been very short, but we just, we were pretty much done near closing at the Magic Kingdom. So we figured we'd go here. You know, while it was a decent wait, it wasn't like, oh no, we're missing all this other stuff. It was totally fine. Because early that morning, I had also booked the individual lightning lane for Rise of the Resistance, which I again put at late morning, which I feel like is a safe bet. You've done a few things already. And then you kind of um, go from there. So after that, we went over and did our lightning lane for Tower of Terror, which I said it was pretty far out. I think it was maybe 11 a.m. or something. It was not that far. It was not your typical, oh my gosh, it's at 5 p.m., which I had been worried about with the studios because I knew we could only stay till 6.30 or so, just so I wanted to make sure I had time to you know, get a rental car, get gas, get back to the airport. You know, We ended up, the airport was not that busy, so it ended up being we got back really early. But my point being, I did, you know, a lot of times with really busy Hollywood studios, what you end up doing is stacking up a few lightning lanes late at the night, even with Slinky Dog and stuff. You don't normally get it that quickly. But I, you know, put it in for Tower. Again, it booked it automatically, you know, booked it right after we hit Slinky. So I didn't even have to do anything. Stand, Standby Skipper did that. And um, love Tower of Terror. When we went in 2022, it was the time, one, it was a lot busier, but two, it was the time when they were only running one of the two elevator shafts. So they didn't really make that common knowledge to the public, but then the waits were so long and that was the reason. The waits now are back to kind of what they should be. Not the busiest in the park, but up there in the upper tier for sure. And um, first time Etta had done Tower of Terror. Also, she had done Mission Breakout, which I feel like is a lot more intense because it immediately throws you up in the air and there's a lot more up and down motion. Where Tower of Terror, of course, you have the initial scene when you're going up with kind of the goat, the people that were sucked into the tower. I don't know if it's called Ghost or whatever. And then you go through the whole dark ride scene, which is awesome. And Tower still looks great. People love it. And the randomized drop sequence always gets a lot of big laughs and just is so much fun. It's my favorite ride still at Disney Hollywood Studios. And I'm not saying it's a better ride than Rise of the Resistance, but it's my favorite. It's the one that if you said, oh, which one do you have to do on every trip? Not 2022 notwithstanding, but within reason, I would say Tower. We booked Slinky first because I know that's the most popular lightning lane. And even on a slower day, I got it at 910 and it jumped. I looked just to see maybe we'll move it back a little bit. And it was already at like 2 p.m. So I didn't even mess with it. So after Tower of Terror, which we had to go all the way to that end, and I should clarify in case you weren't aware, Rock and Roller Coaster is being refurbed for extended refurb again, second year in a row. So that wasn't something that we were going to do. So, you know, I would love to ride Tower again, but just we didn't end up going back down that way during the day. But we did next go to Rise of the Resistance, and oh my gosh, everyone, the Kylo Ren animatronic was working. It was in A mode. First time for me. (laughs) I've ridden this ride on both coasts multiple times, never seen the Kylo Ren animatronic, and it does really help. And also because they have like that wall down to the side, you don't, if you really aren't paying attention, you don't know it's going to be there. I thought that wall wasn't going to move because I was waiting for us to have the whole video screen where he's in the ship and everything else. This was so much better, and the effect of him coming forward and then the explosion, really well done. One of the top elements of the attraction, and while I'm glad that they don't shut down the whole attraction when he's not working and that they planned ahead with the B-mode, similar to how Navi River Journey, I think the Shaman is probably is the highlight of that, And but I'm glad they don't shut it down. They still have a secondary thing, which is more, it's totally different. It's a screen, but it's different than like the Yeti, where they 
did that and then just never fixed it. You know, what more can I say about Rise of the Resistance? Uh, to me, I will say that the scale is awesome. All the different steps, you know, going in the transport vehicle, you meet Ray, or Ray tells you what you're going to do. You go in the transport vehicle, you get into the Star Destroyer. Some of the people playing the Imperials were really funny and really stuck to it. The Rebels less so much. The ones that broke us out didn't really have that same, you know, excitement there. But things seem to be where I know not all the effects are working, but with the Kylo Ren animatronic working and everything else, still cool. Now, I will say, I know I've tried to mention what we paid, and I jumped a little bit ahead of that already in terms of Genie Plus. But first of all, let's talk about Rise of the Resistance and what we paid, because this is still, despite not drawing, I mean, you know, probably as big a crowd, it's a little different because it has a standby queue, so it may be drawing as many people, it's just hard for you to do an apples-to-apples comparison here, but Rise of the Resistance was still $25. $25 per person. So you look at that and, you know, and, it, you know, in hindsight, maybe we didn't need it. There were times at night where Rise of Resistance had a 30 minute posted standby wait. I didn't know that was going to happen when I booked it because I booked it first thing in the morning to guarantee. So $25, but actually with tax, it, it ends up being $53. So you're looking at $53.26. So you're looking at about $26, if I'm doing math correctly, and 63 cents per person to ride it. And we probably saved at the time maybe an hour. So, you know, it's hard to say if you really break it down what that's worth, but I just wanted to guarantee we wrote it because I do think it's one of the, you know, most complicated and really coolest attractions that Disney has made. I do think uh, it doesn't, con it connects with me differently. I think it's, I'll do it every time we go, and I know it's a lot more money, but it's not one of those where if for some reason I didn't feel like spending it or, you know, time didn't work out where I would be like, oh no. I think I've ridden it enough for it's gotten to that point, but I do still think it's a great ride and, you know, a really cool achievement that I'm not sure Disney's going to do something like that again. Though the one thing is you are locked into the whole Kylo Ren, General Hux, Resistance, First Order type thing where you can't adjust it. Even less than like Smuggler's Run, which in theory I think they could adjust in the future. Genie Plus, speaking of money, Genie Plus at Hollywood Studios, they did not realize, or they did, and they didn't want to mess with it, they charged us $32 a person. Magic Kingdom and Park Hopper, I think, was like $37. So again, you're looking at the money there, and you're saying, actually with tax, $68.16. So that's about $34 a person. So right there, again, we are $60 a person just to have Genie Plus at Hollywood Studios and for individual Lightning Lane. And I'm just giving the numbers. I don't want to, you know, I recognize the value. And even on a slower day like this was, we still ended up using six lightning lanes and we did save time. I would say we saved the most time at Slinky Dog and then a tower was probably saved 45 minutes. Smugglers Run later, similar thing. Toy Story Mania, again, it was like 40, 45 minutes. You know, and then a couple of them we saved a little bit, like you know, the Touring Sausage 15 or whatever. But you add it up, we're still saving several hours a day. So you get to the point where you're like, okay, especially when we know we're not going to be there the whole time. I think it made a lot of sense because the last thing we want to do is spend our time waiting in line, especially on a short trip. But I don't mean to belabor the point, but I'll just close out by saying Rise of Resistance still top notch. I'm glad they got the Kylo Ren animatronic working. I think um, this ride's going to be really popular for many years to come. So after lunch, which I'll talk about a bit later, we watched Vacation Fun. We had a little more time. We had booked a lightning lane for Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. And so, and actually, I did my math wrong because we actually did seven lightning lights because I had not done that with Mickey and Minnie. So correction on what I said a minute ago. But yes, we did Watch Vacation Fun, which is mostly a collection of shorts from the newer Mickey cartoon series with kind of a new framing device. And it does have a very funny moment at the end involving Pluto, which I won't give away. It's not essential, but it's kind of a nice way to combine that where we were about to do Runaway Railway. So why don't we just do this first? And then we have a little bit of time and then we got and used our lightning lane. We did Runaway Railway twice on this trip. And I will say that I found it to be super fun. And another thing that I really enjoyed about it, one of the times we were near the front of the train, 
So we saw everything from that angle. We saw different scenes. There were things that when we were in the front, though, we didn't see a lot of elements that showed up later. So when you're in the back, like in the front, you go right to the tornado, for example. In the back, you see the build up and see everything else and then get to it. So it's interesting. I didn't realize as much, which I should, but I think it does a good job with the trackless ride system again Rise of the Resistance does this a bit where some people go to the probe droid and then some don't and everything. But you always feel like, you know, you kind of don't get the best element depending on which one you're on. Here, I feel like there's just so much going on with the screens and everything around you. You're going to see something cool either way. But I found it interesting. And that was why I appreciate writing it the second time because I could compare it to earlier in the day. But yeah, we use Lightning Lane and later in the day wrote it standby and actually... The posted wait time, I think, was 30, maybe it was a little more, but we only waited maybe like 15 minutes. It was super short. So that was cool. And that is part of the day not being as busy where we got to do, you know, Runaway Railway a second time. And that was very cool. Both times I like it. I think, again, if I can separate it from the great movie ride and from capacity concerns in the park... This is a home run. It's it's a great ride. It's good for all ages. There's a lot to see. And yes, there's a lot of screens, but the animatronics they have really make a difference. And the mix and the way it kind of looks weird and everything else, it's just fun. There's a lot of fun little gags. And I think it holds up really well to repeat rides. So I'm glad at Disneyland it's got its own spot and didn't replace anything. I just wish here. There are a lot of areas where they could have put it, I think. I'm saying they needed to update Great Movie Ride. Don't get me wrong but found a way to kind of update it and keep that capacity. You already got the ride system. What could you do there? And that's the thing that still stands out to me. I mean, I like having Runaway Railway in the Chinese theater. It's still kind of a cool way to go in there. There's also a fun effect when you kind of go through the line as you watch the short film, Perfect Picnic. That's always very cool too. And then we did a lightning lane for Smuggler's Run, (laughs) which it's funny. That was an interesting one where... um, it had said like 4.30, and I had set the search because while we were in Runaway Railway, I wanted to search, and the app got us like 2.40. And maybe I could have gotten them on my own, but still, that was a very cool surprise. It happened again a little bit with Toy Story Mania, where it was earlier, too, so we didn't have those long breaks. We are offering the opportunity of a lifetime. I need flight crews to transport this valuable merchandise across the galaxy. Pilots to navigate, engineers to operate the ship, and gunners to defend the shipments. And that is where you come in. Smugglers Run, the first time we wrote it, because we did write it twice, we were engineers, and the people writing it front was a little kid who was really bad at it. More on that later. But <laughs> it was very bad, so that kid led us to having to press a lot of buttons engineer. We were very good at them, though I don't totally understand the scoring system for Smuggler's Run because we were really good as engineers, and then and we were listed as a marauder. That was our score. That was our what it was. And then later, we were in a different role, and we were also a marauder. So I don't understand how what the different items are And I guess, let me look this up while I'm doing this, because this might be interesting for all of you, too, to hear this in case you also don't know. Um, Oh, here we go. This This is what we got here. The options are privateer, smuggler, scoundrel, hotshot, marauder, pirate, master pirate, employee of the month. This is what they have here. Marauder is 6,000 to 7,999, and then you have around it, you got Hotshot and Pirate. You can find this online. This is, again, I'm going by a Reddit post from the Galaxy's Edge group. I'm assuming this is right, but I found it interesting that we did about the same, where maybe it's just when you get to Coaxium and you kind of do a similar thing, that's where you're going to end up. But we were engineers the first time. That time we did a lightning lane. Later on, I know I'm jumping around, but I feel like I'll combine these. Later on, we went back and we rode... Smuggler's Run, standby. The posted wait time, I think, was about 40 minutes or so. And I think we waited like 15 or 20. And that time, we got right behind, randomly, a group of six. And you know what that means. If you're behind a group of six, you get to be the pilot. Yes, the pilot. First time I've ever done that. Etta and I were the pilot. Etta was going up and down. I was left and right. I find that um, left and right, I had less control, really, over... Whether we crashed or not, I could turn us, kind of guide us in the right direction. But I think up and down, also, when you do that one, you get to pull 
the hyperspace, which she did that. That was very cool. Unlike the kid the first time who didn't do it at all, and the dad kept having to do it. But he was younger. I'm guessing he was like six, if that. We had fun doing that. She was really pumped to get to be pilot. And I wanted to be like, I have written this a lot of times and never been pilot. Of course, some of it has been single rider. So then you're almost always engineer. Even my other non-single rider weights have been engineer or gunner, not pilot. But that was a really cool moment. I'm glad we had to do it. And actually, I find being pilot to be much more intense because you also, one, you have the added pressure of the other people in your vehicle getting mad when you're crashing and stuff. I mean, we still got the two coaxium and we got the Marauder rating, which I guess means we did okay. We're in the middle. But it did feel like we were crashing into everything. That's all I will say. So maybe you don't have as much control over that. So maybe it's just, unless you are just so terrible, you're bound to get a decent score. But I will say about Smuggler's Run, I still feel like they need to have different missions. They need to have more you can do. If they did that, I think this ride would really jump up in terms of success. Right now, I think it's fun. The fact that we got to a point late in the day, in kind of early evening, where we had time to do one more standby wait. Of, I didn't even bring up Tower because it was the other direction. But Etta did say she wanted to do Slinky Dog, but that had an hour and a half wait at the time. It had not gone down. So I was like, okay, we can't do that because that was our first choice. I'm like, sorry, let's try again. But it was basically Toy Story Mania, a third time on Runaway Railway, or a second time on Smuggler's Run. She chose Smuggler's Run. I'm glad she did because I finally got to be a pilot. But that says something where she was more interested in doing that than to do Toy Story Mania. Oh, or Rise of the Resistance because it listed 30 minutes. I told her we would do that. Stand by. She chose Smuggler's Run over Rise of the Resistance. Interesting. Very interesting. And I know she's done that a few more times, but we had done Smuggler's Run once, and that was her choice. And it actually had a longer post to wait. I'm guessing they both would have been the same. Actually, I think about it. Smuggler's Run, I think posted weight was more like 4550, and Rise of the Resistance was 30, which is insane. I don't know how that could be 30 minutes. But it was interesting, too, because those posted times, when we were walking over towards Galaxy's Edge, Indiana Jones, Stunt Spectacular, and Frozen Sing Along both let out at the exact same time. So that's where a lot of the people were. And I think it was the last indie show of the day. So a lot of people went to those. And then we quickly went, oh, shoot, and got in front of a lot of the people because you know how that goes for sure. So that is something to remember in the late afternoon or even when those shows are going, especially indie They can have an impact on lines around there, especially at Galaxy's Edge, because you have a lot of people, maybe they're at Galaxy's Edge, and that theater is so big that those late mid to late afternoon shows, you may have a lot of people who've done their rides at Galaxy's Edge and decide, hey, let's go see Indy, or it's a warm day, let's go see Frozen. I did not really want to go see the Frozen sing-along, but I have never seen it, so we had enough time where it was literally starting in like five or ten minutes where I did say to Etta, like, why don't we just go do that? Because I've never seen it. And I also could not convince her to do Indy. Of course, if we had done Indy, we would not have likely had our second rides on something, if it was Runaway Railway or possibly Smuggler's Run or whatever. So it's kind of a trade-off where I am glad we got to do that because we got to be pilot, and I'm glad we got to do the second ride on Runaway Rail. And I'm glad we got to do the second ride on Runaway Railway. Really hard for me to say that phrase, Runaway Railway. I just cannot say it. I just get stuck on it every time. That's why I don't do the whole thing. But let's go back to what we were doing that day. So after our first Smuggler's Run, we're in mid-afternoon. We then did Toy Story Mania with Lightning Lane. Again, it listed for something on the Disney app. The one we got was like 2.40, so it actually was like 10 minutes later or something. In between, though, while we because our time didn't let up now, we did do Muppet Vision 3D. And Muppet Vision, actually, um, we did not do Lightning Lane for that. Not really needed ever, ever. Do not use your time on that. Ever, ever, ever. Big enough theater, even on a decently crowded, not full day, it was maybe, for us, it was like a half full of that. And I think it's really cool that they actually upgraded it with those projection effects around the theater. Because, like, you see all the little, the little 3D guy, you see a bunch of him now on the walls, and I believe there's more destruction on the walls at the end that was not there. But the fact that Muppet Vision, the screen looks better. Everything seems to be clicking. People still love the show and laugh. Etta kept talking about some of the quotes, like the, um, you got a minute and a half. The <laughs> We talk about the pre-show. where It's all around Sam Eagle, where Sam's like, now proceed to the theater in an orderly fashion. Everybody goes, do 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 and like runs through. She thought the Rizzo the Rat is Mickey Mouse. We saw most of the pre-show because we just missed a show. It was very funny. And, of course, you have the, you know, the 
a salute to all nations, but mostly America. And I know you all know Muppet Vision. You don't need me repeating all the lines. I won't get going on Statler and Waldorf or anything else. It's really cool that Disney, without any fanfare at all, added some new effects to Muppet Vision. I wish they would do more of those around the resort because it's really appreciated and, and adds new life to a show that's been in place for a really long time. So then we did Toy Story Mania. I did defeat Etta, but she did better on that than Buzz Lightyear. I think I think Toy Story Mania, especially with some of them, with them putting a lot of things right in front of you, is designed where no one is going to do terribly. Buzz, sometimes it's hard to figure out which laser is mine and everything else. You can't move the even take the guns off the vehicle. It can lead people to not do as well. I gotta say, I mean, Toy Story Mania is very rewritable. I only usually do it once a trip. So it's one of those where I never feel like, oh, I've got it mastered. I don't even remember. It's like, oh, this game. Oh, yeah, this one. And you just kind of go through it. And um, I've done good scores, but I think it is one where if I did more, I think that I would get much better scores if we continue to do it because I don't really have it's similar to Buzz in a way. We'll, we'll do sometimes do Buzz twice in a trip, and I've been doing that for many years. But I still don't, it's not like one of those things where we just ride it all the time. So it is a case where, you know, maybe, you know, we don't ride it as much so we don't ever get that good. Yeah, because I had 116,100 on Toy Story Mania and Etta had 79,800. But, you know, with Buzz, it was very different where her score was pretty low. Though her accuracy, hers was actually better than mine. My accuracy was only 31% and hers was 33%. So not huge scores, but given that I only ride toys, we didn't even do Toy Story Mania in California so we didn't get to that part of DCA. So just that we did it, it's always fun to do that. And here's something. This was the only thing we did on this trip that I had never, ever done before is ride inlet twirling saucers. <laughs> It wasn't even like a top priority or anything. It wasn't like Toronto Guardians. It was basically like we had time. Lightning Lane was available immediately. Had a 20-minute standby, which, again, that would have been seemed a little long because this it takes forever to load and unload and everything else. And people always get confused and it takes a long time. Even with Lightning Lane, we probably waited like 10 minutes or so, but not bad. But, you know, I will say, I think it's a fun ride. I like the idea of you're just riding along behind the alien and going and you kind of the way it kind of takes you from one circle to the next is very cool. And it's also not that thrilling. And that's a good thing. I kind of have the impression of being more like our scrambler at our local Six Flags or something, which is more intense and you kind of fly around. And it's, you know, it doesn't make you sick, but you got to be a little careful with. Here, maybe a little bit, but it's on the tame side, which I think is exactly what Hollywood Studios needs. They need a few more rides. I mean, this... Runaway Railway has a few moments if somebody really gets motion sickness again with Daisy, with everything else. But both of those are good for most audiences, and Disney needs to keep going that direction in this park. Because there are a lot of rides that if someone gets motion sickness, even like Smuggler's Run or Star Tours, they're just not going to do. And it really limits what they can do. My parents are going to be going to Disney World, and my parents are, you know, um, you know, they're getting up there. So, like, you know, as far as age... Haven't been since 2019, and I don't think they're even going to go to Hollywood Studios because they really thought about it. And they're like, what could they really do? There's not, they could do Mickey and Minnie's. They could do, they would do Muppet Vision. Sure, they could see a stage show or see Fantasmic, but that's not really a full day at a park. They don't really care about Star Wars. They're also not at moving around as fast anymore. So there's just not enough thing. They don't even have the Little Mermaid show going right now. So that's where Alien Twirling Saucers, they would not do that. But for kids or for even some older adults that are a bit younger, might be able to do it. Oh, also before Alien Twirling Saucers, we did Star Tours for the first time. And that time we got Naboo. No, we got the Wookiee Planet. And then we got Princess Leia, Help Me Star Tours, you really hope. And Naboo, which is the one I always get. Oh my gosh, I've gotten so many times. Whenever I don't get the one tied to the new trilogy, whichever's out, we always get Naboo. It's like, come on, you know, I feel like I never go and see some of the early ones like Hoth anymore. Like, do they still show those very much? I'm not really sure. It seems like it's more related to the prequels and especially the sequels, which I get. And I'm really excited that they're going to add very soon, actually, Ahsoka characters or relating to that world. That's going to be super cool. I thought Ahsoka was a great show and also relating to Andor. Though that may just be, and again, it may just be a case where you have, 
Andor telling you need your help or something like that. But loved Andor, so I think that's going to be a big hit. Star Tours has always been an undervalued, really cool attraction. Ever since they switched it to where it can be different things, like all the different destinations, and the fact that they keep updating it, which they haven't always done very well. I think Tori Star Mania, that had one little part, and then Smuggler's Run yet has done anything. I know it has only been open for like five years now, almost. Well, almost five years. They need to continue to update these, and the benefit of that, I appreciate that they finally added Coco, added something to fill our magic. Need to continue to do elements like that, and because Star Tours does that, it continues to do that. I love the rewrite. I love the fact that there's not much of a wait that you can either walk on. Like the first time, there was a 15 minute standby wait. We said, "Well, we don't have a lightning lane to use right now." This was, I think, between. Um, I want to say this was after Smuggler's Run, before Toy Story Mania. We didn't have the ability to book yet. Um, we we went in there and there was actually no wait at all. <laughs> it said 15, which was basically zero. And that's really common for that park because people just go to Galaxy's Edge. But parks need rides that are still things people enjoy, that they like, that don't have weights. That is crucial to any park, like a people mover kind of thing. You know, just almost no weight, always almost no weight that people like. You need that. And I think Star Tours fits that bill at Disney Hollywood Studio. I don't care if there's Galaxy's Edge. Keep it open. If you want to find a way to connect it, or I hate to say it because you have to move, remove Muppet Vision, but do that, fine. But um, it doesn't matter if you have Galaxy's Edge. Star Tours is still great. Keep that in the park, Disney. Don't mess around. And so we did that standby for the first time. So now we had a point where we we had eaten some ice cream from Gertie the Dino. Worst, worst ice cream we had on the trip. I'll talk about that later. We were at a point where we had done everything we really wanted to do. And so then we're like, okay, let's do Runaway Railway again. I already mentioned that, but again, we waited standby. Didn't take long at all. Really fun. I appreciate, that's the thing that is so hard to do when Disney is at max capacity, spring break, everything is re-ride attractions. And that's what I love to do. I love, that's what one of my favorite things about this trip is we got to re-ride attractions at every park. And not just like your silly attractions, like re-ride headliner attractions. When you're doing that, you know that the crowd's at the right level and that Genie Plus is worth it. Because what we would do is you do one of them as Genie Plus when they have the bigger weight, and then either whatever time of day it works, later in the day, likely, you do the second one without it. And that's what we did with Runaway Railway. And then we did that. And then I really wanted to do Star Tours again because I thought it's not good. We have a lightning lane. It doesn't really matter. There's not going to be any weight. And then, but I'm like, we have time for one more, like I mentioned. And it chose Smuggler's Run. I was like, you know... We are very far away from this right now. It was like, you know, we were over by Runaway Railway and stuff because I think we did that after ice cream. She's like, I don't care. So we walked all the way back again for the third time, walked into Galaxy Edge because we had gone, done Rise of the Resistance, turned around, came back, did Smuggler's Run to the third time in the Galaxy's Edge, and we did Smuggler's Run, and it was worth it. We got to be pilots, which I thought was super cool. After that, we did Star Tours. This time, we got all the Rise of Skywalker. So you're going in all those big waves and everything else. And then you have all... We had Maz Kanata for our character. We did the second half with Rise of Skywalker, which is all the Star Destroyers. Not my favorite, but I again, I appreciate that they are still doing references to the films. Though lately, I feel like I've done that. I, have, I, I think I did do Crate which was the second sequel at some point, but I typically have done The Rise of Skywalker multiple times. But cool to do that again, and then all you know, all we had left was to eat, and then we were heading out of the park and getting ready to go back. And I will just say Hollywood Studios overall, my opinion hasn't really changed. I still feel like there's more they need to do. I think it is going to help a lot when they re-add, one, where Rock and Roller Coaster is open again, but also when The Little Mermaid show comes back. That's another element. Because we didn't really do the live shows. They got the Beauty and the Beast show running. We didn't end up staying for Fantasmic, though I would have liked to have seen it. I just couldn't make it work for the trip. We didn't do Indie, though I love that show. We had, I've had several recent shows, including with Brandon Kiley, where we talked about it, and then did not do Frozen. So we didn't do the live shows, which, you know, if you want to say, if you want to make it a full day, you could have not repeated stuff or whatever. Or we could have got there closer to Rope Drop. And then plus we had extra time that we would have at least had another two hours in the park. So we could have done more before Fantasmic. We could have easily done more. The wait times are going way down. Who knows how many things we could have done. So we ultimately at Hollywood Studios did 14 attractions. We did seven lightning lanes. Let me just read them off to make sure. We did Slinky Dog, Tower of Terror, Runaway Railway, Smuggler's Run, 
Toy Story Mania, Alien Sprawling Saucers, and Star Tours. Star Tours did not save us any time. The other ones all did. And then we also did one individual Lightning Lane attraction. So, you know, in a shorter day where we're there from, from about, you know, 10 till 640, let's say about eight and a half hours, you st- we still did a lot. The park technically was open about 12 hours, but we did about eight and a half and still did a ton. So ended up being very cool. I'm glad we got to do so much. So now that you've heard more than you probably wanted to know about every attraction we did and everything on the trip, I'm going to talk about some other elements. The main thing is we stayed at Port Orleans French Quarter. We did three nights because our third day at the park, we actually left. Our flight out was at 930. So we flew nonstop both directions. Worked out totally fine. I will say, if you are flying Southwest and you are an adult who is flying with a child, I believe they set the threshold at 14 and under, and it was 11. And you get a boarding group that you're concerned is not going to get you to sit together. Like, we booked right away. I clicked it 24 hours out. I did not pay for their extra charge to get, like, the A group or something. We were, like, C13 and 14. I went, oh, no. Oh, no, what are we going to do? Because, obviously, family boarding is typically only six and under. And this is just for Southwest because they don't have assigned seats. So I went up. I had read on their app that essentially if you were a single adult traveling with a child 14 and under that they will try to make um, try to assist you to make sure you can sit together so I just went to the gate and I asked them and they were right away they were just like oh yeah yeah you can just come during family boarding so family boarding if you're not familiar comes after the a group before the b group so both directions I was able to do that so you know we had to check in still, but the where our group was, where there was no concern with 100% full plane. The last thing I wanted, I had this image of them coming down the aisle going, which we did see on the flight back, going, hey, um, these two need to sit together. Can someone move? And I avoided that, so that was good. So I know I jumped away from French Quarter, but that gives you an idea first of our arrival. But French Quarter, we stayed at Standard Room. We used a Disney Visa discount, which was 30% off. I think the rack rate was around 320 or so, and that made our room about 228 per night, which I know is a lot, but for spring break, that kind of discount, um, that's a pretty good deal for a moderate resort. And so I thought about switching to Caribbean Beach because Caribbean Beach, Skyliner, you don't even have to transfer. That's a big draw. And Caribbean Beach was a little more money, though. I think it would have been like 270 or so. And you say, well, Dan, it's only a little bit more. But if you think about it, if you really break it down, that per night with tax and everything else, you could pay for a good chunk of the Genie Plus payment. So it's like, okay, we have the convenience of the Skyliner. It's a trade-off. But then, hey, if I stay here, then I'm able to, you know, I don't have like, my budget wasn't so tight, but that, that's kind of a trade-off in a way from there. Or another way to look at it is I rented a car. And I could have done the Mirrors Connect, which was would have been $67 for two of us. The car rental actually ended up being, I think, around $197. So, and that was for midsize from Alamo that I booked two days earlier because, because um, I booked something else and then switched it up and everything. But it worked out. They don't charge you until you get there. So that's another trade-off. Basically, the amount of time I could have rented a car... The same additional cost for that is similar to the additional cost, so a bit less for Caribbean Beach. And really, I looked at it, and I was like, we know we're going to be, especially once we decide to rent a car, we know we're going to be driving the the last day to Hollywood Studios. Skyliner doesn't really help me there, because if I've rented a car, I'm not going to take the Skyliner, because I want to have our suitcase and everything in the car. We can go right from the park to the airport, saving time. So then you're really just paying to do it on the Epcot day. And I thought about it, and I was like, well, I have a car, and French Quarter is really close to Epcot. So really, will we save any time? Yes, you get to ride the Skyliner, and it bore out that way, really. I mean, I know when we parked, it was a significant walk to the gate, but if you think just about transportation, because Skyliner 2, you're at the other side, so you got to account for that. I mean, I guess if you're trying to rope drop, you're right by Ratatouille, so there's a benefit there. But really, the French Quarter drive, you essentially pull out of French Quarter to go to Epcot, you turn left, you turn right, and then you just go around a bit. Less than 10 minutes. Really easy. The convenience really wasn't a factor because, you know, you're at Korean Beach, you're taking a bus to Magic Kingdom, and I'm at French Quarter, I'm taking a bus to Magic Kingdom. And distance, I hadn't really calculated the distance there, but my thought is like, 
okay, I'm not at a Skyliner resort. The odds are maybe better that they're going to have more buses from French Quarter because that's such a primary transportation element. So that was another factor. So I figured it was kind of a wash overall in ter- terms of transportation. Even with the coolness of the Skyliner, I also did not want to have a situation where Lumen ascended and we had to battle a giant line to get to the Skyliner. Whereas what happened with us is we just kind of moseyed out pretty casually and ended up doing pretty well and did not have any weight. By the time we got to our car, because we were parked way off to the side, basically we where we parked, you're looking right at the Guardians of the Galaxy show building, if that gives you an idea. Nobody leaving there. It was so easy. And again, not super packed day, but still a lot of people, no problems at all there. But the biggest factor in me choosing French Quarter was the convenience and it being small and compact and easy to get around. And it checked all those boxes. I thought it's a beautiful resort. You know, I've I've used to saying I've stayed both at value, which I find kind of ugly, but useful, and deluxe, but only at Disney's Animal Kingdom Lodge for the most part. I mean, we stayed at the Swan, but that's kind of a sort of deluxe, you know, but feels more like a different type of hotel. So I haven't stayed at a lot of the big ones. I mean, when I was young, we stayed at Contemporary and Polynesian, but I haven't stayed at Beach Club and Yacht Club and Boardwalk. Someday, someday. (laughs) So for me, this moderate, the rooms are not that much smaller than the Animal Kingdom Lodge. I mean, I think, you know, 30 feet, 40 square feet, whatever, not much. And with only two of us, it's still, I think the bathroom is a bit smaller, but, you know, not that much smaller. And they do have a nice setup with the, they have a separate door with the toilet and shower. And then also a curtain if somebody wants to, like, change clothes where you're not squished into that little room with the toilet and shower. You can change by the sink and you have more space, which is nice with two of us also. So works out great. But I am going to post a video of our room. I mean, I it's not super fancy quality, but I'll put that on the YouTube channel. It should be up within the next should be pretty soon, actually, from when this comes out officially. So you'll be on the lookout for that if you want to see what our room. But I will say the room was comfortable, plenty of space, looked nice. It had plenty of places for charging when you have Magic Band Pluses and Apple Watch and, you know, an Anchor portable charging device, which worked great. Talk more about that in a bit. And other f- iPhone, iPad, everything else, you need a lot of chargers. We never had any issues with that. They got a coffee maker. It is Joffrey, so it's pretty bad. But I was able to make that in the room. We brought our own breakfast, so we did not eat at the French Quarter, which means with doing that, there was no point to be buying the refillable mugs because we only ate one meal at the French Quarter. And that meal was at the food court, which is the Sasagula Floatworks and Food Factory. Really nice food court. You know, doesn't feel like a food court. Feels kind of, you know, nice counter service restaurant. More reminds me a little bit of the Mara, the way it's set up, which is at Animal Kingdom Lodge. I had a very good sandwich. One of the best things I had on the whole trip, the honey barbecued pork sandwich with zesty vegetable slaw on brioche bond came with fries, $10.79. I'm not going to go through all the prices the entire trip, but I wanted to mention this because this has to do with the resort. And then Etta had a super slice of cheese pizza, which was ridiculously large. Again, eleven twenty nine. Not a kid's thing. Just that's all that you know. Got drinks, whatever. So you know, it wasn't that expensive. Just for two of us, we each thing comes out about eleven and twelve dollars. Plenty of food. Also a comfortable setup. We also then did go over and get beignets there, which is at Scat Cat's Cafe, not the place where you see music, but we just got a pack of three of those. Um, and I didn't love them because the sugar kind of falls off them into the bag. So then it's just like you're eating a big hunk of bread with this little sugary. But no, they're good. I mean, I again, I don't think it's like a must do, but I figure we're staying at French Quarter. That was one of the longer waits of the trip, too. Not to order. To order was like five minutes. But then we probably waited a good 15, 20 just to get them, to get our package of three. And there were a lot of people in front of us. So that did take a little while. Not a huge deal, but just something else to think about there. But I will say one other thing, if you're staying in the near future and decided you wanted to do French Quarter, is that the pool is currently closed. But we were able to go, the first night we did go swim at the Riverside Pool at Port Orleans Riverside, which was about a 10-minute walk. And it's a very nice walk. You're walking along the lake where the boat that goes to Disney Springs is. You're not walking next to cars or road or anything else. And Riverside is bigger, I believe, than French Quarter because it has three different pools. We went to the main pool. The other ones weren't even open by the time we got there, which is the pool at Old Man Island, which has... Riverside has a bunch of little pools around the resort, 
But we went to Old Man Island, which is the pool in the middle. It has a fun slide. It has some nice um, kind of, again, like like an old mill kind of setup. Pretty big. It's not on par with some of the best pools at the resort, but pretty solid. Yeah, 95-foot water slide. It's kind of fashioned after an abandoned sawmill. Um, but it's cool. I thought it was worth walking to, especially given that our pool was down and very easy to get to. I also, Riverside just looked, Riverside also looked attractive, but all kind of big. So I did like the fact that French Fort was so small because basically we pulled up and parked within a one minute walk from our room. And the thing is I had requested building four, which is the closest one to where the food is and the bus stop. And I figured also it would be close to the parking lot. Very easy there, though. All of them are kind of close. So that didn't really matter. We were in room 4110, which is on building four, first floor. I'd requested upper floor, but hey, we got the right building. So, and we were on the corner, but the resort was so sleepy. And I'm not sure if this was just low occupancy or a mix of that. And just, it's that way normally, but it was so nice and so relaxing. The food court was not super loud. It worked out great. So, I mean, one, just, I would stay there in a heartbeat again. I would not stay there with four of us because the room, a little small. I'm not sure I would even stay in a kind of lodge with four of us to do a standard room unless I had some sort of villa because we're just getting, it'd be too tight. But with two of us, moderate resort worked out great. This almost felt deluxe, even though, I mean, the rooms, obviously the big thing is the exterior door versus the deluxe where you have the interior door. But I never, there really wasn't much noise or anything. It was just pretty quiet and pretty easy to get around. First day we drove to Epcot, like I said, took about 10 minutes each way, no problem at all. Second day, we took the bus to Magic Kingdom. We we got to the bus at about 9.46. It said it was going to arrive at 9.52. actually arrived about a minute later. <laughs> so we were able to sit down, got to the Magic Kingdom, maybe 15-minute ride at most. The way back, when we we were coming out about a little after 10, got on the bus. One downside, the bus was there, which is great. The downside is we had to stand, which after a long day at the parks was a bit much. But still, again, 15 minutes or so, we were back, got back there, no problem at all. Last day, we drove to Hollywood Studios. Again, a little longer, maybe 10 to 15 minutes, but no problem there. And then afterwards, we left about 6.40. I did stop and get gas, so even though we hadn't done much driving. Then drove back to the airport. Um, no problems there. Just I got gas on Disney property because the cost did not seem to be any higher. Not a huge line. I just um, went to the one by the boardwalk. There's a gas station there. Maybe added a little bit of time. We got, we still got over there. We had till eight o'clock to return our rental car. I think after everything, we got to the airport like seven forty, and then plenty of time. Ease Alamo was super easy. Another thing I want to mention too is we used the visitor toll pass, which is a free pass you can pick up. You have to buy the, you have to order the app, and they charge you ten dollars just because they give you this basically this little um thing you had hang on your rearview mirror. And instead of having to worry about paying cash or buying a sun pass or anything else, you can just drive down the toll roads, which are important because it's a lot quicker hanging on your mirror. It, it'll refund the $10 minus whatever you pay on tolls. If you return the decal at the airport, you pick them up. Basically there's a vending machine down where you get rental cars. It's called, again, it's called visitor toll pass. I highly recommend it. Our tolls though, to actually get all the way to where we needed to go were $2.11 exactly each way. So not huge, but it's annoying to have to pay cash, get off the highway, get back on, do all those things. So it worked out great where then it refunded, I think like a little over $5 of the 10. So no extra fee. And also you get a really low rate. It's much better than doing whatever the rental car company offers on that. So I would highly recommend that once again, again, I'm getting nothing from them. I just used the service, found it to be very helpful. I'd never used it before. If you're renting a car at MCO, this is not something all over the country. It's connected to the Sun Pass. I think it's connected to the Easy Pass or something, but you can drive to the Sun Pass lanes. You're not going to get in trouble. You don't have to stop at the cash one. Saved us a bunch of time there, too. So that's about it in terms of the Port Orleans French Quarter Resort. I gave it very high marks. Everything, the, the housekeeping was every other day, if that matters to you. And because we were only staying a short time, we actually, we had housekeeping before we arrived, but only once during our stay, which was on 
the second day, the Magic Kingdom day, they did housekeeping. So not on the, we thought maybe if they did it on the first day, the Tuesday, then we get again on the Thursday morning. So that wouldn't really matter, but they did it on the Wednesday. So technically we had it before we arrived and then during our stay, which was nice. And they put in the little tall animals and, and they put a little Mickey head in terms of beads and everything else. So nice little touches there. The H2O products that are now, you know, in the bottles in the shower didn't seem very good to me, actually. I don't know if it was just um, they're the exact same, and I just didn't notice. I know H2O has kind of gone under, but I thought it was still the same, but I found it just not to be that exciting. I mean, they worked. I didn't bring my own stuff. They work fine for a trip, but just something to be aware of there. And just, um, you know, we watched, you got the Disney TV channel. I watched the, the introduction from Josh tomorrow, said hi to me. The Disney TV channel, very short. Not of it seems like you watch the whole loop and it's about 15 minutes. They did have another channel which just showed the new Mickey cartoons, they repeated them a lot. But if you're kids or if you like those, that's something that we watched a lot just in terms instead of trying to kind of go check out anything else. That was what we did for the most part when we had TV on at the resort. But yeah, very high marks for the resort. I thought it turned out great. I should also mention for the room request, I used the touring plans room request finder, which I figure. Touring Plans membership is pretty reasonable. I use the Lines app a lot. I also use the Crowd Calendar, though it's hard to say. The Crowd Calendar was way off this time because it was super high. But the Room Request Finder I found, especially the Animal Kingdom Lodge, was very good because I could request standard rooms that ultimately face the animals. So you could pay a lot less than Savannah View rooms. And it worked both times I stayed in the standard room at Animal Kingdom Lodge. So here I picked a room that was on an upper floor but was in building four. So I didn't get the upper floor, but I did get building four and being so close to both the food and the buses when everything was really nice. So I have no complaints and it worked out well, like it has in the past. And I mentioned it earlier, but another thing that we bought for this trip was an anchor nano portable charger for iPhone and the reason this worked out so well is this does, you don't have to bring a cord or anything. And I know there's a lot of things like this. This is a power bank and it worked with my iPhone 14. We bought it and it was a pretty reasonably priced item. There are a wide range of prices for this. It was also very highly rated. We paid about $25 for it. And, you know, if you don't already have a fuel rod or anything else that you could use there. And it has a little connector. So it basically almost becomes part of your phone. It just hooks up to the bottom of your phone so it fits easily in your pocket it's very small. And then that connector folds in. So it's not like sticking out in a weird way. It doesn't accident. I had these really old power banks that would accidentally get turned on and off. It didn't charge very well. This I found charged pretty fast. So I never had any issues with my phone running out of power. And again, it's just me using my phone and using it for everything. Part of that is I didn't use my phone as much for things like refreshing, but I will say that this worked out well. Again, no extra benefit for me. Sure, if you want to go on Amazon and use my affiliate link for Amazon, great. But that's not why I mentioned this. I mentioned it just because I think it was a really good product and it also helped out and made things easy and it wasn't super expensive, which is what we were kind of going for. It's something that I'm definitely going to use in the future, probably at any park I go to, whether it's, you know, if I go back to Kings Island or Silver City or anything that has apps that you're going to use or if I'm going to be shooting a lot of video, it's going to work out really well, I suspect. All right, now I'm going to talk about the food we had. I already mentioned what we had the first night at the French Quarter. I might not, I'll quickly go over what we had. I may not list every single thing we did. We did not eat a full meal at the Connections Eatery, but I will say it's a really cool space. Also, they have the Starbucks right nearby, and I've heard really good things about the food in general. We stopped there and got some fries just as a quick stop at one point after Guardians was down. But I've heard great things, and the one thing I will say is just it really had with all the light and all the windows and all the tables, it looked like a really nice setup. And when you can use mobile order, it's easy to access from a variety of areas around that World Discovery or even World Celebration area. So a nice setup there. Normally, I would eat possibly have lunch at Sunshine Seasons, and we were there around lunchtime, and that did work out for Etta, who just got some mac and cheese, but we did something interesting there where I did want to get something from the Flower and Garden booths, but those are typically smaller, and so Etta got the macaroni and cheese, and then it came with green beans, and we also were able to get a side of, of apple slices, so I ate the green beans, which I don't know what the deal is with Disney and green beans. I've talked about this in the past. They must get some amazing deal. They gave me so many 
Or they gave us so many. But that's something, too, where I, Etta technically is 11, so she doesn't even the age listed for kids' meals. But it works out because sometimes it's the type of food she likes, but also the portion size. But also with them giving you drinks in multiple sides, like she, you know, we go up there, we, it's what, $7, you know, I eat the green beans and apple slices. She eats the mac and cheese. Um, We had snacks with us. We brought snacks from the room every day that we had brought just to kind of give us a head start. We didn't go overboard, but you figure you put like a protein bar. I had like a Lara bar and then I had some nuts and then Etta had like some Cheez-Its and some Craisins and everything. And, you know, you just start in a fig bar. You start that. She had her little bag. I've got my pocket. You know, at least then you're not immediately going in hungry. You've had breakfast. You can eat that when you have time for a snack and then save your room for more things that you're going to like. You know, yes, she had kids mac and cheese, but still it ended up being pretty cheap. We both get, you know, she gets milk. We get cups of water. Very reasonably priced there. And then I went over to Honey Bistro. This was the one type of food that I got from the Flower and Garden Boots. Typically, we did more. We did more two years ago. But when it's just me and her, I wasn't as a food-focused trip. But I went and got the chicken and waffles, which are described as crispy chicken and a honey-sweet cornbread waffle with whipped honey butter and spicy honey. Now, I will say that this was really good. It was also a little spicy, which spicy honey was described there. But it was basically like a dessert. I mean, it was so sweet. The honey, you've got whipped butter and honey hence the name Honey Bistro. And, you know, it um, it was so messy and there was so much, um, you know, I actually thought it was syrup, but I guess it's spicy honey technically, but so much of that. But I will say it was really, really good. And at least with the chicken, I'm getting, you know, you kind of add that and it offsets the green beans a little bit, that's how it works. But, you know, it was, it's listed around $7 and slightly under that. And it's not your typical tiny little dish. It's actually pretty filling. And you could think of that as, you know, I wouldn't just say it's a light snack. It could be, if you combine that like with something else, you could actually, it's actually kind of a a full meal. And they did have honey glazed cauliflower there too, which I did not get. But if you think about it, if you got both of those, that's basically like $11 and it's a whole lunch. So not a bad option there. And they're typically very highly rated. And that's one of the reasons I went to that. I had read some best of the fest type things from like, I know Shannon did a really good job. Again, I'll mention her from WW Prep School and Prep to Go podcast. But they had some really good posts that were like, here's the best things you get. That was one of them. And it's also very convenient because it was still in that area kind of over um, before you really get all the way into World Showcase. I like that area so you're not out in the middle of nowhere and having to go on some sort of long jaunt to get there. But I will say the best thing that we had this day, that was good. And yes, I'm tempted to say the ice cream in France, which was awesome, especially the caramel ice cream I had there. Etta got chocolate and I got caramel. Oh my gosh. And the line wasn't that long again. Usually that has a really long line. That was in the evening around 730 at night. Oh, that was so good. But no, no. The best thing there is Regal Eagle. I mean, and I live in St. Louis and, you know, I know Kansas City is kind of known for barbecue and we have Memphis nearby with barbecue, but St. Louis holds its own with barbecue. If you ever come here, go to either Sugar Fire Grill or to Pappy's or Bogart's. Those are the places you want to go in St. Louis. And I say this in that I feel like I have a pretty good gauge of solid barbecue. And I will say Regal Eagle is right there. It's much better than Flame Tree. I like Flame Tree barbecue, but I think I'm grading a little bit on a curve there where I'm like, well, it's better than Pizza Fari or Restaurantosaurus. But no, this is excellent. I also really like the space because last time we had ate outside because we were kind of doing that because, you know, coming up, still kind of in the edge of the pandemic era then. But here where we were basically like, oh, we're going to sit inside. The place is huge. And, you know, they've got refillable drinks. I actually got a soda and was able to refill that. Everything's really easy. You've got all the condiments there and it wasn't crowded at all. We were there probably around 6 p.m., so pretty busy dinner time. But I had the sliced Texas beef brisket sandwich. Oh, boy, that was really good. It's $14. You put it on. It's on garlic toast. You get your choice of side. I believe I chose fries this time. And Etta had a kid's cheeseburger, which also I think was very solid and came again with sides there just um very good very solid did not feel crazy full but you get a good portion there and um if that place the way it's set up not just because of the whole muppets type idea but if that place was around town i would make a trip there because i think it's pretty good and it was the best thing we had at epcot 
Okay, moving on to the Magic Kingdom. The Magic Kingdom, if you're going to eat counter service and not go to Skipper Canteen, is kind of a dead zone. I know there's Columbia Harbor House, and everyone mentions upstairs, but every time I go, it's always packed. But it, that doesn't really fit with, and it doesn't eat chicken strips. It doesn't really eat fish, so you're kind of really stuck there. I would have, if I was going to choose a counter service place to go in Magic Kingdom, I would go to Columbia Harbor House. I would try to sit upstairs during an off time. Or something like that. But since that was not available, we were very limited. And as you can suspect, this was not my favorite day of eating. Etta's favorite thing was probably getting the Mickey ice cream bar, which I think they're kind of overrated, but she always enjoys it. And so we got that during the day from some random cart in Fantasyland. Don't you know you know about the Mickey ice cream bar? We don't really talk about that. So we ended up, we were in Tomorrowland. If you remember how things were going, we had gone on Tron. It was, you know, we had done Buzz Lightyear. It was like 1230 years before we went to Seven Dwarfs Mine Train. Like, okay. Cosmic Rays is right here. We can use mobile order, which makes it really easy. We don't have to stand in line in a lot of places. We did end up eating inside, though, um, you know, not near Sunny Eclipse. Etta was not interested in that. Thought he was a little creepy, which I guess I understand. I don't know. I wanted to, I was like, this is the opportunity. It's not crowded in here, even at a busy lunchtime. But again, she just had something basic there. Nothing to work. Nothing really to write home about there in terms of her food, but she seemed happy about it. What I ended up getting, I thought about getting a spicy fried chicken sandwich, but I was kind of looking, I was like, okay, well, let's do grilled chicken. So I got their grilled chicken sandwich, came with bacon, cheddar spread, crispy onions, and Coca-Cola cherry barbecue sauce. Blah. (laughs) That's what I will say. And not throwing up sound. Blah. Blah. Like meh. You know, just to me, this was the least inspiring, exciting thing. And this will be surprising to me, given what we had for dinner. But, um, you know, I don't love cheddar cheese, but I, I try when it's something like this to get it how they describe it. Cause I feel like if I didn't get it with the cheddar spread, it would be kind of bland. And I'm not even sure that was an option. I don't think that was an option on mobile order. Sometimes the mobile order, you'll be able to like add or not add cheese or things or customizations, not always. So sometimes if you have complicated customizations, you're going to have to go to explain it to the person at the register. But I just like, I'll just eat it. It's fine. It wasn't terrible. It was just kind of bland and forgettable. So I don't really have that much to say about that. I will say that doesn't mean that everything's bad at Cosmic Rays. It's just, I think we ate there in 2022 and it was fine. I should have got the spicy fried chicken sandwich or gotten something entirely different. Um, This was worst meal I had in the parks, which will tell you something. But I did want to mention Aloha Isle, something that I'm sure you all know, but I did not know at the time. Not even an option for mobile order. Now, I don't know if this is all the time or if this is something that sometimes, but you probably all already know this. I'm sure if I Googled Aloha Isle mobile order, there'd be 150 articles from Disney Food Blog talking about it or something like that. But so I was not going to mess with that because there's a giant line. You know, it was a little, it seemed a little warm even in the 70s. Or Magic Kingdom just kind of crowded. But after we finished going... Or as we were going to Tiki Room, I set up the mobile order for Sunshine Tree Terrace, which, of course, is the other place that has Dole Whip that's right around the corner. It's actually over back over by the Jungle Cruise. So, you know, I hadn't had it before. What I really wanted was the Pineapple Upside Down Cake Dole Whip from Aloha Isle, but they don't have that Sunshine Tree Terrace. So I just ended up getting the Barks Root Beer Float served with Strawberry Dole Whip is what it was. And it's six twenty nine. dollars very tasty. A lot of strawberry Dole Whip, too. Sometimes when you get root beer floats with ice cream, they don't have much ice cream, and you feel like you're mostly just drinking a soda, which actually the sodas aren't that much less than 629 But this is like a lot of ice cream and then a little bit of root beer, which is the way you want it if you're going to get this. So solid, not blow you away. I don't know if I would get it again, but it was something different to try this time. So we had planned to go to Pecos Bills because Etta does like things like they have like a bean taco with beef or beans. You know, she likes things like that. So I thought we would do that. But we just ended up in a situation where we had done the Big Thunder Lightning Lane. And then we had done Small World and we're doing a Lightning Lane for Haunted Mansion. And the next step for us was to go over and do Space Mountain. And I was like, do we really want to walk all the way back to Pecos Bills? No, we didn't. So... We went. Yes, we did. If you can guess already, we had dinner. Yes, at Pinocchio Village House, <laughs> which in the past I've been there. It's been so nuts. The kids screaming and everything has been terrible no matter what time of night. This was not that way. It wasn't super crowded. It was pretty easy. We again used mobile order. And I thought about ordering a salad, but their salads just seem so basic Caesar salad, which aren't really healthy either because it's like iceberg lettuce and everything else. So I just got a pizza. 
And uh, I got a pepperoni pizza, and then I got a cheese pizza, and um, not that great, but better than Cosmic Rays. But I will say, at this point, I did say to myself, okay, Dan, tomorrow you've got to eat different food. You can't just get such generic theme park food. I just felt bad eating this uh, pepperoni flatbread, but this is what the Magic Kingdom does to you. You're kind of in a certain location, and you're just like, well, we're just going to eat what's there. And this is where you end up eating a really basic cheese and pepper, a really basic pepperoni pizza. But, you know, it wasn't insanely priced if you look at what the two of us got. You know, I think we just got cups of water. So we're going to have like $12.79 for me. And then Etta had the kids' version, which um, of flatbread, which I think was like $7, like a pepperoni flatbread without pepperoni, obviously. So, you know, we'll get over $20. So not insane for two people, but it was very bland food, but still better than my cows and gray sandwich. I don't know if they'll tell you. So that's it for the Magic Kingdom. The best thing for me this day really was the root beer float. That was the best thing. The other stuff, it served its purpose, but um, not that great, I will say for sure. Okay, so final day was at Disney's Hollywood Studios, and I was focused on ABC Commissary in terms of counter service because they have really gotten better. It used to be known for terrible food. We had really good food there two years ago, and this was the case again this time, where this is the case where we kind of did something where we combined what we got because Edda was interested in the black beans, which were with pork, but it was more the broth, but it is something to note if you're a vegetarian, but very good there. Black beans and also topped with some cheese. That wasn't enough for a meal, really, though. And then she wanted fries. I'm like, well, I guess I could get two sides. So instead, what I did is I ordered the pork carnitas tacos, which are really, really good. Oh, man, they're good. And the description is they're topped with avocado, salsa verde, and pickled onions served with Mexican rice and pork black beans. So um, I had, had, had the black beans from mine. And then I did order a side of fries. So, you know, really weird fries and beans meal. And then I ate the tacos and the rice and also got a drink because they have um, refills on soda. I'm not a big soda drinker, but I find sometimes in the park, you know, you can get water over and over. But sometimes when you're having a meal, I just want to get, I usually drink root beer now. We're drinking root beer now. I don't really drink soda much, but sometimes with a meal like that, it's just really easy to do that. But I will say, if ABC Commissary is a hidden gem, I don't know how hidden it is, but if you went there years ago and it, you thought it was terrible, give it a shot again. Even the options they have, they got like a buffalo chicken grilled cheese sandwich, shrimp tacos, but these pork carnitas tacos, legit. After eating Pinocchio Village House, this was almost on a different level in terms of quality and was excellent. I did get a cold brew at one point from the little stand over there, the Joffrey stand, kind of near the old Toy Story area, if I remember correctly where that was. Still bad, but <laughs> I just wanted something and didn't want to go wait at Starbucks, you know, and um, I just do not like Joffrey's very much. I am sorry. Dinner was at Backlot Express, and again, this was one where I had never been way back in that corner of Backlot Express. One, there's a lot of kind of fun gags, but also there's a huge thing here. I had actually said to Etta, well, there's not much space inside, so we'll get our food from mobile order, and then we'll go outside. And then I walked in and was like, ooh, there's a lot of seating. And then you went around the back, and they're like, there's more seating. What is the deal? But here we actually had a situation where I was not wanting to eat a huge meal. And so, you know, she got a kid's meal. And I also, I got the kid's meal of the Southwest chicken salad, which, um, pretty good. Again, you know, romaine lettuce. I would not say this is healthy in a way, because I think... The, this dressing, the, the lime, the house-made jalapeno lime ranch dressing, the whole thing. I know it says it meets Disney nutrition guidelines for complete meals with kids, which I did get. I don't know about that, but I will say it was pretty good. Seven seventy nine dollars for an adult, not bad at all. So two of us get that. You know, we're talking, we got some waters, whatever, like pretty reasonably priced, like $15. So I sound like such a cheapskate, but when you're spending so much money at Disney on other things... That sometimes with the meals, especially when you're traveling with a fairly picky eater that is not looking to be adventurous or isn't going to be like, that's going to be super happy basically with just uh, macaroni and pizza and a cheeseburger and everything else. And she does eat like fruit and everything else. We had fruit in the room every day. So I don't want to oversell the unhealthiness. When you're at Disney, you're just trying to find something solid that everybody's happy, whether you have two people or more people. And that was the case here. So I know nothing I really gave here in terms of dining is going to be mind blowing for you or saying, oh my gosh, here's this really hidden gem. I'll just make the point. ABC Commissary, solid. Regal Eagle, 
very good. Magic Kingdom, dead zone. Go to Skipper Canteen. That's all I can say there. And of course, Flower and Garden, tons of good options there. If you do have the chicken and waffles, I think you will not be disappointed unless you're looking for something that's not that sweet. But hey, it's a place called Honey Bistro. You're kind of, you know what you're in for. And also Sasagula, pork sandwich, excellent. Excellent. All right. So before I finish here, we're kind of getting to the end here. I do want to talk about, I want to end it on a positive note because this largely was a very fun trip that has me thinking more about, okay, when am I going to go next? Even though I have done everything like, you know, there's not anything left where it's like, oh, I haven't done this yet. Or, oh, there's something that I still need to do. I've done all the big attractions on both coasts, really. I mean, there's things like, well, this time I still do it. It's so exhausted I did. There are things I haven't done, but I will say there's no huge, giant headliner. It doesn't mean I can't go back. I actually would enjoy the idea of just going back and having a more leisurely trip. But we'll see. I'm not sure when the next time is I'm going to go. I really want to get to Universal again, even before Epic Universe, because I don't think we'll be getting there. After dealing with Super Nintendo World a couple months after it opened in Hollywood, not sure I'm ready to deal with that at Epic Universe, though I am super excited. The news that has come out recently has been really interesting. But I'm going to finish with 10 things that stand out to me of this trip. And they're all kind of positive things. You know, some are pretty obvious. There's not These aren't really surprises. But just kind of when I look back at the trip, some memories I have of it or highlights or anything else. So we're going to do that before we finish here. One is I am a big empath. And... I love the excitement people have on certain attractions every time you ride them. And I call it like infectious excitement. The two examples I will give are Tower of Terror and Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. Tower of Terror, every time, it's creepy and whatever else, but going up and down like that, people just, it's like so funny. You see the pictures and people are doing silly things. Everybody's got their arms up and everything. Just so much fun. They're, you know, just everybody's having everybody's having such a good time. And that's the case with Big Thunder too, because of the way Big Thunder is set up with lift hill, thrill, lift hill, thrill, lift hill, thrill. People like get just giggly and then they're able to take a breath. So even if somebody's not super, super into thrill rides, whether it's a kid, someone older, whatever, they can enjoy it because they know it's just a short shot of adrenaline and Big Thunder, especially at night, people love it. I love the clapping at the end. That was really common when I went to Kings Island and that's something great. Second thing is just seeing the wide range of ages of people really extending themselves going on attractions like Guardians of the Galaxy, Cosmic Rewind, and Tron. Some of them may regret it afterwards, but I think that is something that is unique to Disney parks where a lot of times people have that thought like, okay, it's crazy, but it's still Disney. This is not a place that's going to like a Six Flags or whatever, even going to Cedar Point or whatever, that's going to really push me to such a degree. So you look, I was in, you know, I'm in lines for Guardians, and you see you know, kids. I'm like, really? That kid's tall enough? I guess they are. And then people that are you know, in their 70s or whatever are still doing it. And I don't mean, I'm not saying like, oh, all these people are still doing it. But just the wide range of ages and excitement and people just um, trying to extend themselves to do whatever coaster, especially with Tron and Guardians there. Disney is starting to have more coasters that are on that edge, kind of like Expedition Everest and Rock and Roller Coaster, but even more modern coasters. Similar thing, um, I love seeing the anticipation. Like I had that going and riding those coasters. This is the third thing. But just looking at seeing all those people kind of talk like, what's it like? Is it too crazy? What 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 what's it like? You know, what's that? And that's that's the feeling I had, but I really got that with Guardians because you stand in all those pre-shows and you really and everyone's just like, is it too intense? And somebody's like, Oh yeah, this is intense. Or whatever. You know, you saw that with Test Track. There was this guy, you know, telling his friend on the ride, like, hey, you know. He, though we told him they, they fixed it a few years ago, it used to be more intense, which I thought was funny. I was like, really? A couple of years ago, this was somebody who was like 14 or 15 or whatever. But things like that are really fun. So moving away from that, another highlight for me was seeing Happily Ever After at night. Had not seen it in person. I know it had been there for a long time, but that wasn't really how I rolled in terms of touring. Getting to see it in Frontierland in a comfortable space, not packed in with people, Hearing the music, because I had really grown, especially after it came back during the pandemic, I found that, you know, I didn't get much of anything out of watching Epcot Forever or watching even Harmonious or watching Fantasmic even to a point. Once you've seen those like on a whatever live stream or resort TV one, round the go, whomever, it got old pretty fast. And those channels show them so often. 
happily ever after every time if I see this one, I'm like, oh, I'm going to stop and watch this. And th- But seeing it, it's totally different to see it there. That was, to me, possibly the biggest highlight of the entire trip, was seeing it and actually seeing it even without the projections. And I will say, I've, Wishes was fine to me, and it's not about the quality of the show. It just didn't, shows that are fireworks that play Disney music don't really do that much for me. Something about the way, even the versions, the versions of Go the Distance is so much better in Happily Ever After. The the version of Love is an Open Door from Frozen is so much better. Just really cool versions that, man, I wish on Spotify, they, I mean, it's really easy to find, but that they just had the official like Happily Ever After audio because it's really something special. Next thing is when we were at Epcot, we were coming out of the land and it was like 8.58 and we had just ridden Living with the Land and there were so many people running. We saw people running down the stairs to get to Soren, but so many people running for the pavilion to get in that last ride. Like, there's not a wait. We got to do it. I found that to be so entertaining. I love that type of just giddiness. People weren't like mad or anything. They were just like, let's do it. And they're running and hopefully, I hope they made it. hope they made it. But that was another thing that I really enjoyed on the trip. Number six, getting the chance to see impressions of France and also the atmosphere. You could tell there were people there, not just me, that I, I'm not projecting, that were super excited for the chance to see it. When you have a show that a lot of people like that's only for two hours, the one benefit is you feel like you're getting kind of a bonus, something really cool by seeing it. Love impressions of France. Bravo, Rick Harper, and everyone involved with that film. Still love it. Love the fact that I still got to see it nearly, you know, more than 41 years after it originally opened and it looks great. Number seven, getting to go on headliners either with really short lines or through Lightning Lane or anything else and having to go smoothly and that feeling like you're getting something extra, like getting back there and riding rides that are generally super popular with 10, 15, 20 minute waits, or even just doing a quick lightning lane, or even running to Big Thunder and getting to do that at night. This feeling of extra. This is something that when Disney is super crowded, you don't really get. And even when you pay, sometimes with lightning lane, you still would wait 20, 25 minutes. Whatever. It'd be a giant line because everyone's running back to it. But we didn't really have that experience. But when you go there and you have the, and it somehow isn't crowded or somehow it works out and you have no line or we got our own boat on living with the land or whatever, that just feels really special. And that was constant each day throughout our trip. And um, I wish that was more common. It sounds weird. I wish Disney had fewer people there. Wow, that, that's a grand statement. But just that type of feeling and that type of vibe, especially at night, is really infectious. Number eight is some really funny ride photos because with Genie Plus, you were able to get ride photos um, on there for, well, for free. It's included with Genie Plus, so I don't just have to see the weird thing with the big logos of PhotoPass, which I'm not going to end up purchasing. Getting all those was fun. There were some really fun ones. There's Slinky Dog. I have this weird smile. I think we refer to, we. my brother and I used to call this the Disney smile. You'd be checking into your hotel and everyone, like these dads, would have this giant grin and everything. And people, you know, and I have that smile on that picture. There's one really funny one from Test Track where everyone in the car has their arms up. And, you know, mine, I'm holding up my hat and it looks weird. But all six of us are doing it, and it wasn't planned or anything. It was just something we were doing. Of course, Tower of Terror always has really funny ones. There's people doing, like, speak no evil, hear no evil, see no evil, which one guy kind of messed it up. He didn't totally time it, but um, they were doing that. There's always people, I have my arm in the air, people looking silly. I love the ride photos from there. And then there's the usual, like, Buzz Lightyear, where we're seriously trying to shoot. And then the ones where you don't even really know they're taking the picture, like on Frozen or whatever. You're like, you just look really bored. But um, some really funny ones, and I love that those ride photos are there. Number nine, I had really good experiences this time. Usually on every trip, you have one cast member or a couple of them that aren't rude, but are kind of like not your expectations. They're not going out of their way. They just, you know, and I know they don't get paid very much, and I know that people can be mean. So I don't hold it against an individual cast member. I will just say this trip, I like I said, I think earlier, either on this show or the show before, that um, when it's not hot, and it's not super crowded. One, the guests are going to be happier. And two, that means the cast members are. But I've had good service across the board. Really nice cast members. You know, very, um, might ask a question. Very understanding. I had some questions about food and about various things. Always helpful. And just um, really pleasant. 
And that's something that's been common with Disney, but I feel like hasn't been as strong the last few times. Also saw quite a few college program cast members and cultural, the whole exchange program, program people, which um, were great to see in the parks once again. And number 10, to sum it up, just the fact that we packed so much into three days, so much fun, so many memories, so many attractions, and did it without having any big meltdowns or having any, like, we hit a wall, which did happen to me last year. I remember at Universal Hollywood where I was like, I really wanted to ride something and I just couldn't, you know, I was just like, the lines were so long and I just, and I just had to eat something. I just grabbed a piece of pizza and ate and that helped. This time never had any moments like that. I'm not saying everything was perfect. You'd have kind of indecision or things breaking or you'd have to wait in too long a line or whatever, but nothing too significant and memorable. Things just worked. Disney World, when things work and the lines and there aren't super long lines, it's still a magical place. Still amazing. I'm not saying everything is perfect, but there's still magic in those parks. And that's where I'm such an empath, where if I spend too much time online or in um, groups on Facebook or whatever, and people are really negative, I have to remove myself from the situation. Even I have a hard time reading news a lot, especially when you get into politics and nerves and everything else, because I just take it too, take it in too much. So I've had to kind of pull myself back from a lot of social media or whatever. But I will say... Um, when things are good and you're sensing, like I said earlier, sensing the excitement of people, it's such a thrilling experience. And I love going to these parks when people are happy and getting to do things and not wait in long lines. And yes, you had moments where kids were melting down, especially at the Magic Kingdom where parents were pushing too hard or whatever. Kids just, sometimes it happens, you know, it happens to anybody. Didn't really happen for us, but it's just one of those where it kind of reinvigorated a little bit my feelings about the parks. I'm not saying that everything was perfect. Disney still needs to move faster and build some new attractions and start announcing things and start doing stuff. A lot of my opinions about the overall direction of the parks, though I am happy that the that the board vote went towards Iger's group because I don't feel like the way it was heading, I don't feel like the replacements would have been good. It was, you know, but I will say that, and, you know, now that they've also made um, some deals in Florida, I've been able to hopefully settle that, that um, we're in store for a real push. And having done this trip, I would go back in a heartbeat. Not cheap. I tried to talk through a lot of different prices and everything else. So I don't want to make it seem like it's not a big expense because it is, but had a wonderful time and um, hope that some uh, that hearing about our trip not only uh, made you maybe want to go to the parks, but also gave you a few cool, fun tips and ideas about what you might want to do in the parks. So that is going to do it for this episode of the Tomorrow Society podcast. If you're fairly new to this show, there are 228 past episodes of this show, including part one of the trip report, but also interviews with former Disney Imagineers, fellow podcasters, authors, other experts on theme parks. It's just a fun way for me to connect with cool people, have smart conversations, and learn a bit more about the parks. You can go to tomorrowsociety.com slash podcast with us at the end, or just look back to all the episodes or wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever. I love to hear from you. Let me know what you think of this trip report. Email me at dan at tomorrowsociety.com. Follow me on all different types of social media. Check out the YouTube channel where videos should be coming soon from our trip. I didn't shoot too much, but I shot a few clips that I think will be fun for you to see. If you'd like to support this show, you can do so through Patreon and get access to some really cool perks. Go to patreon.com slash tomorrow society, or you can buy me a Dole Whip, specifically a strawberry Dole Whip with Barks root beer or a pineapple upside down Dole Whip that I will enjoy the next time. Go to tomorrowsociety.com slash Dole Whip to learn more. The music you're hearing right now was written by Adam Hoagie, performed by the Sophisticated Babies. Next week, I'm taking a week off. The first week that I have taken off since the start of the year. But this gives you a chance to go back. I suspect many of you have not kept up with the weekly episodes. I am sure there's a past episode that you have not caught up with yet. So that is what I'm doing. I am taking a short break here, but we will be back with another fun interview in two weeks. I promise you, it's it's being recorded. I promise you that it will be out and I think you're going to enjoy it. That's what I will say at this point. Thank you all so much for listening to this trip report and for hanging out for more than two and a half hours with me to talk about my trip to Walt Disney World. And I will talk to you again very soon.